is your safety and security a major concern? Garth and Natasha welcome the Honorable Fitzgerald Hines, Minister of National Security, focusing on the major divisions, Defense Force, Fire, Prisons, Police, and others. Minister Hines will highlight the accomplishments recorded in 2021, as well as the Ministry's goals and objectives for the new year. You don't want to miss Eye on Dependency at a new time, 10 a.m. this Sunday. Listen live on I-95.5 FM or watch the live stream on Facebook or YouTube. Eye on Dependency. We don't just share stories. We change lives. We change lives. Celebrating 20 years of our independence. It all started with a phone call from Brooklyn to Natasha Nunez, my co host. 20 years ago, there was a need I felt that we should have frontline education on substance abuse and its related ills, especially targeting members of the Trinidad and Protective Services. So I made that phone call to Natasha, we came home met with Senator the Honorable Joan Yule Williams at the time, who was Minister of Community Development Culture. Told her what the plan is. She said yes. And 20 years hence, we are here today. And we thank God for that. Good morning, Natasha. Good morning. Good morning, Garth. Good morning, Trinidad and Tobago. It is such a pleasure to be here with you this morning. <laughs> I'm stressing one morning. Um, yeah, 20 years, a, a good pull, a good pull. And we hope that we have been, you know, enlightening you along the way, sharing information with you that is useful in your life and also contributing to, you know, the improvement and development of our society and issues reg regarding substance abuse and drug trafficking and all of the other issues that we cover here on Iron Dependency. We hope we have been doing that for you. And welcome to our new time slot this is amazing to me yes and it's amazing. thank you very much for joining us and uh, remember folks we are not broadcasting on i95's facebook page but i on dependencies facebook page and mm -hmm. youtube channel yes please subscribe click the button subscribe and you will get notifications every time we do something go on air that is this morning there's no different to what we do as you know from time to time ministers account for their tenure and what they have done for their ministry and in their ministry the successes some um and and of course plans that they're in store for us for the future well as you know the national ministry of national security is a huge or has a huge mandate and we are very pleased to have this morning the minister the honorable minister of national security the Honourable Fitzgerald Ethelbert Hines, who <laughs> will take us, name, yes. yes, and who <laughs> will take us to the places this morning, and we have a whole lot to cover with the minister, so we ask you. We have a lot of images to show you as well. Yes. So if you're interested in seeing these images um, about the achievements from the ministry, please log on to I95 and Dependencies Facebook page or YouTube channel, and even even our breaks their information yes so. and we encourage you as well to like and share the live on facebook and youtube so that other people know about it like and share subscribe to our youtube channel like our page that is how you help us to grow online right and and of course once we see you we acknowledge and yes. remember this year we celebrate in 20 years so we have a lot a lot of things in store for you so please be a part of it and help us in this this journey of educating the people of Trinidad and Tobago. 
as I said, during the break, we even have information. So let's take this first one, and when we come back, we straight to the minister from the counter trafficking unit, Trinidad and Tobago Fire Service, and of course, our promotional video. So just a few seconds. This will just take a minute, two minutes. We'll be back. Stay right there. Ah, boy. I feel like I'm going to buy myself a senorita tonight. Nah, nah, nah. You know you might be promoting slavery. Slavery? Mm -hmm. What are you talking about? Hey, modern day slavery or human trafficking is just what some of these people just do. You know some of these women were tricked to come here? Some are held against their will, abused, and even beaten. Most times the girls don't even see any of the money that is paid for them. And every night, they just had to come out looking nice and sexy for somebody like you. Human trafficking is a serious problem and a serious crime. Persons who solicit commercial sex services may be contributing to human trafficking. A message from the Counter Trafficking Unit of the Ministry of National Security. And now, another fire check brought to you by the Trinidad and Tobago Fire Service. If you smoke, use only fire-safe cigarettes, preferably smoking outside. Use a deep, sturdy ashtray and place it away from anything that can burn. Do not discard cigarettes in potted plants, dried grass, or leaves that can ignite easily. Be sure that butts and ashes are completely out by dousing in water or sand before throwing away. Fire Check, brought to you by the Trinidad and the Tobago Fire Service. Dependency with Garth and Natasha. Reality Radio at its best, where every life is a biography. Sundays at 10 a.m. and exclusively on i95.5 FM. And streamed live on the Ion Dependency Facebook page and YouTube channel. Thank you very much for staying with us. This is I on Dependency at our new time, 10 a.m. Thank you for joining us on I95.5 FM and our Facebook and YouTube streams. Yes, and, and of course, we were just informed that we are also broadcasting on I95's Facebook page as well. Yes. So we have three platforms for you that you can sit and, and view what we have for you. And those of you listening, we will try to talk you through it as much as possible so you can understand what's going on. So we have with us via video link the Minister of National Security, the Honorable Fitzgerald Hines, and um, we thank him for his time this morning. So welcome to Independency. Minister, can you hear us now? Just a little, little better. Right. All right. Um, Still having some difficulty. Our technical man is working on it, and he will make sure and get us up to uh, see Gary has all the volume up here. So um, things should be sorted out in a few seconds. And folks, we are joined by the Minister of National Security this morning to start things off. And... Uh, we are really happy to have him. We have a lot to go through with the minister this morning. So, folks, and the minister appreciates the time that we have. So, um, let's jump right into it. Minister, good morning again. Still having some difficulty. I'm only hearing you very, very, very faintly. I, I can't say what this is all about. Um, but we are hearing, but we are hearing you very, very clear. clearly. That so means the listeners will be hearing you too as well. I'm up to the max on my volume. I don't know what's happening. All right, but you, um, once, but as I said, we are hearing you loud and clear, and I'm sure the listeners are as well. 
So we will try our best to to speak directly and loudly as possible until short man fix and the technical man fix this problem. Is that okay with you, sir? Well, um, I'll try. <laughs> you find me a little off whack. Yes, but, but, but please, but, I'm with you. Yes, okay, sir. So let's jump right Thank into you it, Minister. Thank you very much. The Ministry of National Security is one of the more demanding ministries in the government. Um, it, there's a mandate with three general areas, and I'll just of responsibility. So we're talking about maintenance of law and order, public safety, defense against aggression, management, disaster preparedness, monitoring and control of flow of persons in and out of the country. For those who don't understand the complexity of this ministry, i just a brief synopsis um, on the divisions, the agencies, and the units that are part of the Ministry of National Security, sir. Well, in respect of the... I'm still only hearing you very faintly. I'm, I'm really having a serious problem with this. But All right. except what you can... The, the question, and um, in respect of the schedule as issued by Her Excellency, the Ministry of National Security has the responsibility for the airspace and the territorial waters of Trinidad and Tobago, the cadet force, matters of citizenship, the defense force, all of the formations, all four, the regiment, Coast Guard, Air Guard, and the defense force reserves. We have the responsibility for drug enforcement and interdiction, drug trafficking and money laundering, the forensic sciences and forensic services, DNA services, global security issues, immigration, intelligence gathering, internal security, management of illegal immigrants and deportees, national emergency and disaster management, offender management, office of disaster preparedness and management, parole and prison management, community service rehabilitation and youth offender programs, probation services, public order, safety and law enforcement, which involves of course the police, the fire service, the prison service and lifeguard services, security of government officials and government property, the supplemental police, victims of crime, witness protection, care and support, work permits. And we have a number of committees under the purview of the Ministry of National Security. The Mercy Committee, as it is well known, properly called the Advisory Committee on the Power of Pardon, the Cadet Force Advisory Committee, the National Emblems Committee, Protective Services Compensation Committee, and the Work Permit Advisory Committee. We have um, the what used to be the Citizen Security Program, and now we have just changed the name. The exact name doesn't come to me, so I wouldn't venture it, but we have just changed the name for good legal reasons. But we'll be doing basically the same things, things communicating with the citizens and getting, getting them involved in resolving some of the issues before, before they turn to hard, hard crimes. And of course, finding the statutory board, criminal injuries, compensation board, the Defense Force Commission board, the Defense Council, which I chair, the Firearms Appeal Board, the National Operations Center, and the Strategic Services Agency. That is the list of the issues that the, Her Excellency has ordained for the Ministry of National Security. Wow. And given the, the breadth of, of what you're responsible for, um, it is it's obvious that you can't do the work that you do alone. Um, you cannot operate as a single entity in terms of securing the nation and I'm sure that there's a lot of collaboration with local regional and international stakeholders could you tell us a little bit more about those partnerships oh, and, certainly. Yeah. a very critical, very critical element of the business of, the business of national security is indeed strengthening and maintaining partnerships with organizations local including, for example, the NGO, I on Dependency, and we have worked closely over many, many years. Um, all the other NGOs, of course, that's local. And then we work with, we run a whole of government, whole of country approach. So all ministries are in lockstep with the Ministry of National Security. We have regional arrangements 
And we have, of course, as you correctly pointed out, international arrangements with our traditional partners like the United Kingdom, the USA, China, the European Union, Korea, and many other countries. So we do maintain and we seek to build. So I've had, for example, in the past nine months since I came to this desk, many and several interfaces with representatives of these particular countries and organizations across the world in our relations with them. For example, um, the Shah's Affairs of the US, Mr. Shanti Moore and I have had frequent meetings dealing with matters of security um, because of course, as you know, there are many Trinidadians in the United States, many United States assets and personnel here in Trinidad, a trading partner, and all the other countries. So we do have strong bilateral and even multilateral arrangements with many, many countries. And, and, and we work very well. Recently, we had in the fight against COVID much uh, re 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 interaction with, with China who provided material to assist us in this battle. And of course, um, recently as well, I met with his Grace Archbishop Jason Gordon, who came to speak about the issue of the migrants to Trinidad and Tobago, particularly from Venezuela. And we've had a whole host of these. Well, we are showing some of the um, we are showing our regional and international relations. Minister, we are showing some of the images now as you speak. Mr. Um, you must forgive me. I can barely hear you again. I'm so sorry about this. This is all right. Um, I, yeah, we really don't know what it is um, because um, Mr. Hinkson has done everything on this end possibly to help solve this problem. But um, we, will, we will continue as we let the listener know. Thank you for joining us. You're listening to Independency, and we are speaking with the Honorable Minister of National Security, Fitzgerald Hines, and he's taking us through the paces of some of the, right now we're dealing with the partnerships. You can join us on the I-95.5 Facebook page or I Independency Facebook page or our YouTube channel, I Independency, to, to, jo to join this conversation here this morning. And, um, Minister, we, we're trying our best, but as I said, I know, we... I know, I appreciate that. These things yeah. happen, it's technology, it's part of the course, and um, yes. I, I understand. And this is the first time we are having this, as we've had many, many conversations over many years. Yes, so yes. I easily understand. But right, so we... But that I'm not getting you cleanly, so I'm a little loath to responding. Maybe I should try it next time. Uh, you know. Are you hearing me any better, sir? Um, just marginally. Marginally. Still not confidence. Right. Yeah. Um, so, so, what, what, what I'm doing here now is trying to... Test another device. Okay. And now we are not right. hearing you. Yeah, you, you just went off the air a bit. Um, folks, uh, as I said, you could continue to, to um, log on to the Facebook page or YouTube channel so that you can see the images and what we have to show you here this morning. As you know, technology now affords us this. And um, the minister is this morning accounting for his stewardship and the ministry by extension. So while the minister makes the adjustment on his device, um, we, we thank you once again to your, you know, our loyal supporters for continuing to believe in what we do and for continuing to keep us, to keep us uh, relevant as... Well, I might tell you yes. that I have just switched on another device uh -huh. and I'm hearing you much more cleanly. So I'm beginning to think that the problem Perfect. was with me a culpa. <laughs> <laughs> These things happen. So, yeah, but, um, you know, I, I hope that we can make better progress from here. I, I switched to another device and I hope that this does the business. Right. Okay, great. Lovely. Right. So, so we, be, let's, we can continue with the partnerships. Um, most certainly. Hinkson? Most certainly. Yes, so we, we have the... Recall yes, go ahead. That recently, after a courtesy call from Admiral Faller, who headed at that time the United States Southcom, 
which is their military all force unit that looks after the affairs of this part of the world, he paid a courtesy call on the Honorable Prime Minister, who I must take the opportunity to thanks for reposing the confidence that he obviously has in me to manage this very important estate that is national security. And he paid a courtesy call, that's Admiral Fallon, both the Prime Minister and on yours truly. Arising out of that, I was invited to witness the handover from Admiral Faller to a general called Richardson, a female, the first female to head Southcom. So again, I highlight that merely as an example of the kind of interface that we must have in matters of national security with local, with regional and international partners. Have you found it challenging? Just on this last last question on this point, have you? What are some of the challenges that you found in terms of actioning on the relationships and the partnerships that that you've developed, especially the local ones? Minister, you're breaking up a little bit now. Um, you're going a little bit in and out, unfortunately. In, 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 in this region and for our benefit, um, I interfaced with them recently too. Uh, and, and on an ongoing basis, I attended an interministerial team. Oh, wow. It would appear the new device is, is giving some trouble as again as well. We apologize <laughs> for this. We apologize for this technical difficulty we're having. Um <laughs> for your loss, not sabotage. Let's um let's take a break and uh, hopefully we can sort out on both ends what's happening and we'll be back. Short man let's take a break. Eye on Dependency will be a morning show in 2022. That's right. Eye on Dependency marks 20 years on the air. We're taking our groundbreaking brand of radio to a whole new audience. Whole new audience. From the team that took you inside prisons in the UK. I was being held in charge for conspiracy to import cocaine to the UK. We spoke with men and women who have paid for their crimes. They didn't tell me if I bring in back and I get catch, I will get 14 years in prison. Then they didn't say that. We brought you the glamour of feature film. I do have a package to drop off in three days. For you, Alejandro, anything. I will pay you each 5,000 euros. And the squalor of death row. It's a common policy from a case in the high court in Port of Spain, and it was in common many guitar. Being from the gate. And of course, the testimonies of men and women with drug use disorders. I was quite devastated and got involved in the wrong company. The man who I used to deal with, he gave me a job to drive him around. That's a go and buy cocaine and smoke cocaine. From Toronto to London, New York to Los Angeles, Scarborough to Point Fortin, and everywhere in between, Eye on Dependency has been your source for drug information. Join us as we move to Sunday mornings, 10 a.m. Don't miss Eye on Dependency. Listen live on I-95.5 FM or watch the live stream on Facebook and YouTube. Eye on Dependency. We don't just share stories. We change lives. We change lives. All right, folks, thank you for staying with us and welcome back to Independency. Remember, you can join us live on the I Independency Facebook page or YouTube channel as we speak with the Minister of National Security this morning, um, accounting for his stewardship so far. And he willingly accepted and gracefully consented to do this interview this morning, and we appreciate that. So join us as we share these images with you on the the minister's tenure as national security minister now minister let's go let's move because we have a lot to um on our plate this morning the ministry of national security you all don't operate alone as we've heard before as a single entity um but as the minister of national security you would naturally have that direct interface with various divisions agencies units you know to discuss work and challenges and all of that um could you share your experience with us um have you been able to have these conversations with because the list is long 
um, and as you were reading out the list this morning, we were wondering, well, how, you how are you dividing yourself among all of these divisions? Tell us about this, Minister. Very, very fortunately, um, we have strong traditions and some very well cleared tracks that we run on. Um, in so far as the general administration is concerned, the permanent secretary has responsibility for that. And um, he is supported by another permanent secretary, that's P.S. Joseph, and we have P.S. Nataki Dilchan in strong and enduring support. Uh, I have found that the Ministry of National Security, a top uh, draw bunch of professionals, people who understand, who appear to understand acutely the need and circumstance. And I have found quite truthfully, and I said so recently in our regularly held heads of divisions of national security meeting, that I'm quite happy with the responses that I have had to my requests or expressions or directions as Minister of National Security. On the broader front from all of the divisions that I have identified earlier in that list, again, I have found top level professionals, honest to God, I am very impressed, top level professionals for the most part. Um, I, I, I have always said, if you leave it, well, if you judge from just the top, those that I interface with, the chief of defense staff, his vice chief, the police commissioner, his deputies, the executive, the OD. For him and, and, and all the others, the head of immigration, I really find a very responsive bunch of professionals who are about the business of understanding what the government's policy is. Yes, folks, so, if you're just joining us, you're listening to Independency, and the minister is, as you know, we're battling with technology this morning, so have some patience with us. We appreciate your patience. Um, in the meantime, you can log on to our Facebook page, Independency, or YouTube channel. Please like and share the link as well. Uh, minister, are you back? Not yet. Well, we were just sharing some images of conversations, meetings that the minister would have had with various agencies under his portfolio. And he's back. Minister, we, we are not hearing you clearly. We know that you're speaking, but we're not hearing you. Folks, um, we will again thank you for your patience. <laughs> we we've done this as the minister said several times with him, yeah, this is but this morning we don't know what's happening this morning. So, I don't know. but thank you for your patience. You stay right there. We will have the minister back with us because we have, we still have um, the uh, a, a lot to cover. The legislation and with the defense force. The, the In the meantime, how about we share some of the video that we have for you, uh, short man? If you can play the the two border security videos one is from the trinidad and tobago police service and the other is from the trinidad and tobago coast guard so we can share that that video with you with you um as we try to reconnect with the minister yes he's, he's back yes, so it's, it's, so that's video p and q all right minister <laughs> yeah minister, yes thank right, you very much right us. so let's let's um Let's let's calm you down a bit. Uh, it should be just so a short video of border security, and you could with the Trinidad Tobago Police Service, and you can um, just elaborate on that. Yep. Please smile.
quelqu'un qui consomme illégal, illégal à Bordeaux. Showing a, a video on the TTPS Coastal River re unit intercepting a vessel with some um, foreign personnel on it. It sounds like to us, and um, that's what yes. that's part of what the minister. And, and you know, we really, I'm really impressed with this minister. And I know you will elaborate on because we just we got news yesterday too of our Trinidad and Tobago Coast Guard intercepting. Uh, a vessel that, and had to come on shore and actually go through the forest to capture these folks that so yeah, these OPVs what, what, are paying what, off. What you are seeing there is a pretty frequent, several times a day sometimes, interface. I'm happy that the public has an opportunity right, so, um, to see this. Yeah? Yes, sir. Yes, yes, um, um, Natasha. Could... Yeah, I, I was, it was just leading us to our next question regarding border security, and that is top of mind for a lot of citizens. And we actually have a question on Facebook about that um, regarding the purchasing of more o OPVs to protect our borders. And um, in the past year, the, the government has acquired several assets um to to do such um could you speak a little bit to to those efforts and you in the meantime you put up yeah, image well, in, so far as, in so far as opvs are concerned the nation is fully aware that under the patrick manning administration, administration of the government of trinidad and tobago we expended quite some money some time some training in the acquisition of three ocean patrol vessels that were intended to lend serious protection and support to our very vulnerable borders. That time we could have easily and better afforded it. Unfortunately, after all of that, a new administration dismantled and destroyed that effort, but the need was still there. Their spokespersons tried to demonstrate that it was no longer necessary but it was still clearly the case, especially with the recent influx of Venezuelans, given the troubles that, ex that existed and exist in Venezuela, and given the continued vulnerability of our border. So when we came to office again... And yes, sir, we speaking with the minister. Australia, and sensing that Australia had similar circumstances with immigrants. And as folks, as you, as you realize, he's going in and out, but we are speaking with the Minister of National Security and we are showing some images now. We're just seeing the Coast Guard vessels and ministry officials um, conducting 
Yeah, for us, we really having some. I don't know if it's the minister's location where he is, um, or the device. But we're gonna we're gonna persevere. Don't worry. And Marval, yeah. And we understand that there are some issues in Marval right now the with the why internet. Dipping, yes, that's why the minister out. is going in and out. But um, we'll continue to persevere with you. In the meantime, you can join us on our Facebook page and YouTube channel, Independency. And for those of you on radio. Thank you very much for being with us as well. Minister, we, um, we just got word that there are internet issues in your area. So that's why we're having this, this problem of you going in and out. Well, at least I'm re re relieved to know that it is not me or my instrument. No, no, no. It's, no, it's, the, it's the area, <laughs> actually. Uh, and even, even down on this... On, you know, yeah, even down on this side, too, we have some um, issues as well, too, but... Hingston is able to battle with it a bit. All right. So, may I continue? Yes, yes, please. yes, Minister. Yes, please. Yes. So, I'm saying that the Honorable Prime Minister, sensing that we continue to have this vulnerability problem, and this vulnerability problem leads to guns on our streets, drugs to stupefy our children, murders, and the mayhem that you see following from the presence of drugs and illegal weapons and human trafficking. So he negotiated with the Australian government and recently we, quite, we acquired CG41, the TTS Port of Spain and CG42 TTS Scarborough. And I can tell you, I can tell you, those two vessels have already impacted positively and powerfully in our border security efforts. Because as you correctly pointed out, only yesterday, with the help of the 360 radar system, which is 100% operational and functional, they were able to identify that vessel coming into our waters. And by the time they moved on it, because it takes about 25 minutes with these speedboats to get in to, to, to southwestern elements of Trinidad and Tobago, by the time they Scarborough, I think it was, one of them got in. That vessel hit land. But the troops on those vessels, trained and prepared as they are, went inland and conducted an extensive search and was unable to unearth 18 illegal immigrants. And that, to me, was a great success. And that followed two others in the same day, just a few days ago. So I was able to communicate to the National Security Council and the Prime Minister on a sustained basis over the last month or so that we have really upgraded our border security with those two vessels. And the Prime Minister, in his astute leadership, insists to me, and I conveyed this to the Trinidad and Tobago Defense Force, actually, Brigadier General Francis, who's acting as CDS, only last week, and Captain Polo, who heads the Coast Guard, that we have to ensure that the presence of these two new assets don't put pay to or put in abeyance the work of the other assets that we have. They have to be maintained as we must maintain these two to the core, to the hilt, keep all functional. And we are now making efforts to get even other vessels. This riverine patrol that you featured a while ago they operate within 2,000 miles of the, uh, within 12 miles, I think, of our shoreline. So they are able to deal with the little rivers and the little inlets and the many little places that things happen. And they are on the job constantly. They played an uh, important role in managing our COVID um, response because there are a number of people with boats. Well, you know of the famous Chandler issue recently and the famous, well, one that is now in the atmosphere, these officers of the Coast Guard, the Riverine Patrol, and in the case of the last matter, the Western Division Police, led by Senior Superintendent Thompson, have been paying particular attention, the Western Division, to the Western Peninsula. In fact, as a matter of government policy, I've mandated the Defense Force Intelligence Unit the SSA, the Shagaramas Development Authority, our immigration, our Coast Guard, all the police, all the elements in respect, uh, in res 
with responsibility for security to concentrate on the Shagaramas area because reports are that it is things have been happening there and we decided that we will do something about it. So I was quite pleased that under the leadership of Mr. Thompson, they have been paying attention to things and there is a matter in vogue at the moment as a result of that. So I am satisfied and I say to the people of Trinidad and Tobago that the asset base is improving, the techniques are improving, and we are constantly trying to keep on top of this because border security is one of the major priorities of the government of Trinidad and Tobago, but it is the major priority of the Ministry of National Security. I see the end result of loose borders in blood on the streets in my constituency and around Trinidad and Tobago on a daily basis, particularly with the presence of drugs and illegal firearms. And I have mandated as a matter of policy and Mr. Jacob leading the police service and Brigadier General Francis leading at this time the Defense Force have committed to a very robust firearm retrieval package effort. Because I think we at the national security level think that every day you hear about a murder here, a murder in Laromaine, a murder in Tobago, that is largely well, it is multifaceted, but one of the reasons is because of the presence of lethal barreled things called guns. And I believe if we remove all of those illegal guns from the streets, in fact, every one we remove makes the society cleaner and safer. That is one of the mandates of the police service in 2022, to focus specifically on gun retrieval in collaboration with our tightened and improved border security efforts. And with that twin flanged approach, we should be able to make your, your country a lot safer for us to work and play and live and study. Right. So, well, we, we could go to that, board, that, that other border security. Yeah, on, on the line, on the, on that same line in terms of border security, how equipped are uh, Coast Guard officers and, and police officers in the Spanish language because that is supposed to be one of the ways that we um, engage with with persons who may be coming here either to migrate illegally or where, wherever or to conduct illegal activities. How are we on training our officers who interact with these persons to speak their language? A very useful question. And yes, I can assure you that we have personnel in all of our forces who are fluent in Spanish, but not enough uh, because of all kinds of reasons. So I can tell you now, the police service is engaging in some training in Spanish for several of its officers. Only, I think it was Thursday, the head of the counter trafficking unit uh, shared with me that there is a Spanish program put on by an international agency um, I think the UNDP for, for persons across the counter trafficking spectrum for the improvement in Spanish, uh, to learn Spanish. And I asked I might share with you the ex to the extent that it is practicable and time permits that yours truly participate in some of that because I too would like for personal and professional reasons to improve my capacity in that regard. So yes, in answer to your question, there's a lot of focus on that across our forces. We already have capacity, but actually as we speak, work is taking place to make it a little more wholesome and make it better and more effective. Excellent. Right, right. so we're speaking Senor. with our Minister of National Security via video link gracias. this morning. And <laughs> gracias. <laughs> and you, have, you can join us on our Andy Pelosi Facebook page or YouTube channel. Um, Shortman, could you just go to the, the queue so that you can show the border security video with the Trinidad and Tobago Coast Guard, please? So we can. All stations, all stations, all stations. This is patrol vessel Charlie Gulf 23. Patrol vessel Charlie Gulf 23. Patrol vessel Charlie Gulf 23. Call sign Nina Yankee Alpha Whiskey. Leaving Scarborough Jetty, making way position one one degrees eight decimal point eight eight nine minutes north. Oh, 
is border management and security of the Coast Guard. They are a training exercise on safety at sea. And I think this is really important too as well. Because you, you hear from the time fishermen find themselves in all type of difficulty. And I think it's something that should really a handle should go on with fishermen are concerned who they just go out there in the boat no communication devices no life-saving devices and coast guard constantly has to respond to save them so i think the police have been doing some training right? yes i see the police well. yeah and i think the police um at one time had offered the fishermen to come and some of them did not show up mm -hmm. and that was so unfortunate but the so police have the 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 unit um, as well have been involved in this in that type of training. So, uh, so right now we are aboard a Coast Guard vessel for those of you listening. And remember you, you still we see you all coming and you can still join us on Facebook and YouTube so that you can be a part of the process. Um, so we would like to say thank you on behalf of Coast Guard vessel now. And we look Getting forward to more collaboration with this is this this was an interesting so minister were you um did you have were you fortunate to be part of this tour and this training no, session I'm I was not, but I consider it to be a very, very valuable, very useful intervention on the part of the Coast Guard. Um, you know, because um, ignorance killed. So it was quite good. And of course, recently we had to interface last year. We had to interface with the fishermen from the Cali Bay area who were coming under attacks at sea by so-called pirates. Um, and we identified that some of them were very local and we worked and continue to work with them to try to improve that. And prior to that, when I was Minister of Works and Transport, one day it occurred to me shortly after the 2015 election, I myself had a boat right to raise funds. And when I was reflecting on it, after the elections, you know, well, maybe about two months after, as Minister of Works and Transport, that I went on this boat ride, we all had a very good time. I'm not a very top draw swimmer, but at no point did anyone tell us where the life vests were, where the life-saving craft were, who was the captain, who were the staff on the vessels, that, and you could see that they were dressed differently in white shirts and, and dark trousers. There was no such thing and I recall on that vessel seeing this black water as the boat went up and dipped across those waves. And on reflection, I said, but wait, if this thing had gone into trouble, I mean, 450, almost 500 of us would have been in serious trouble out there. So I got a hold of the director of the maritime uh, services of the, of the Ministry of Works and we put in place a program. And I'm happy to let you know that since then they have been Prove the regulations and the management of this. And I understand that all boat rides now, just like would happen on an aircraft, they would now brief all of those who would come on. Of course, we haven't had this for the last two years because of COVID, and apart from the lawbreakers, of course. But typically speaking, in those arrangements, the people are supposed to be advised about safety me mechanisms and safety features and safety techniques just like you would on an aircraft before they depart. So I'm right. very happy about that video and I pray it continues. Thank you very much, sir. So let's let's um let's jump to another question we have for you, Minister. Um our national our country's national security agenda is governed by a strong legislative package which seeks to protect the people of Trinidad and Tobago from the criminal elements. Now what are some of the advances that were made in twenty twenty one regarding this legislation? Well, Can we, we see that image, the, and, uh, short man, please? Yeah. Thanks. Go ahead, yeah, Minister. We passed the, pass the anti-gang law, which was not as stringent and as forceful as we had hoped it to be. But of course, the government has recognized very clearly that our fight is, is not only against the criminals. When we go to parliament with laws that take on the criminals in this country, 
we now have learned that we also have to take on the UNC because they stand in the way of the protection of the people of Trinidad and Tobago. They find a thousand and one frivolous, empty, deceptive arguments as to why they cannot lend majority support to bills that will criminalize gangs and criminalize inviting people to stay in gangs and criminalize threatening people that they can't leave once they come in, blood in, blood out, and that kind of thing. And that legislation would have allowed for a person to be guilty of a criminal offense once you can have established he was a gang member. That's all. He didn't have to do anything else. Once you could prove to the court that he was a gang member, that would have been a criminal offense. But the UNC stood in the way. So we had to fight with the criminals and we have to fight with the UNC in the parliament. The upshot was we had to pass a watered down version of the anti-gang bill, but thank God we still have it. There are elements of it and the police are making use of it. Recently in frank discussions, and I saw it in the paper in a public discourse with the um, commissioner of police, Mr. Jacob, uh, the acting commissioner for specificity. Um, he indicated that the police are also to improve their techniques and the way in which they use the anti-gang law to making it far more effective. So I was quite happy that we dealt with that. We also passed the miscellaneous provisions, Special Reserve Police and Police Complaints Authority Bill in 2020. And that was designed to put the Special Reserve Police under the ambit of the Police Complaints Authority, just like their regular counterparts, so that integrity and the management of integrity, which is so critical in the exercise of police and policing functions, could be observed in relation to the SRPs. And also, uh, the Attorney General has publicly signaled, um, and I was very much involved in the preparation and drafting of these when I was at the office of the Attorney General, the private security legislation, which should bring about 50,000 estimated private security operators in the loop to assist in national security. That bill would regularize those firms that employ them. It will impose training regimes on them, equipment, uniforms, better terms and conditions. It would professionalize the private security industry in Trinidad and Tobago. We will have an inspectorate where the state will have a view in, as exists in England and other countries, on what is happening in there. And then with 50,000 of them, we'll have 100,000 eyes, 100,000 hands, 100,000 feet, linking with our national security core operators and therefore make Trinidad and Tobago safer. So I'm looking forward to that coming back to the parliament. We went through a joint select committee and the UNC objected again, created a problem again, and we are coming back to Parliament with it. If we have to take out some special majority provisions, it must be because this is critical. In some countries, private security are trained almost like police officers. So if you go anywhere and you meet a private security officer in a drugstore or in any business space anywhere in the country, rural or urban, you're meeting effectively a well-trained person who can take on the threat until support comes. And that's what we are looking at. Um, also, um, he has indicated, the Attorney General that is, and I worked very much on this. In fact, he was involved deeply in the preparation and drafting and the policy for a bill that really I generalize as integrity testing, where it would permit more routinely the police service the fire service, the prison service, the defense force, the immigration, the customs, and a couple other arms of the government apparatus to be integrity tested so that we could be sure that there are no wolves in sheep's clothing. And more importantly, their colleagues who they work with on confidential operations that can be issues of life and death for themselves and their families are men and women of integrity, persons who they can trust, and not persons who will make a Galil weapon available to criminals on Christmas Eve day and put the whole country, the whole police service into disrepute 
in that kind of conduct. So that bill is very, very important. In some police forces around the world, Saturday morning you are off duty, having your time in the market or whatever, you can receive a call. And within two hours, you have to prepare yourself and get to your police precinct where you will be polygraphed or otherwise tested. And it's done routinely all to ensure that the business of national security is no plaything and it must be carried out with the integrity it demands. Right. Thank much you. Thank you very much. Much appreciated. Folks, if you're just joining us, you're listening to Annie Penis here at a new time, 10 to 12. Um, we have lots to continue with the minister. We said we have some questions too popping up on Facebook. Um, Annette, you know, there are some people who would be viewing us, but we don't see them. So we're not seeing this person, but there are a number of people um, on other pages too as well. So whatever Barney up to, let Barney <laughs> do his thing. Um, but we're speaking with Minister of National Security this morning, and he is accounting for the Ministry's National Security and his stewardship, um, stewardship so far. And we're just running through some images and videos from 2021. And of course, the minister still has to tell us the plans for 2022. It's one minute to 11. Um, Hinkson, let's, let's take a break now. Give the minister a chance to take a sip because when we return, we have some more questions for the minister. The minister probably could peruse Facebook in the meantime to see if any of those questions you can answer. Um, Helena, we will try our best to speed up and take some calls too, as well as you requested. So, Minister, we're going to take a quick break. We'll be back, all right? Stay right there, folks. Ah, boy. I feel like I'm going to buy myself a senorita tonight. Nah, nah, nah. You know you might be promoting slavery. Slavery? Mm -hmm. What are you talking about? Hey, modern day slavery or human trafficking is just what some of these people just do. You know some of these women were tricked to come here? Some are held against their will, abused, and even beaten. Most times the girls don't even see any of the money that is paid for them. And every night, they just have to come out looking nice and sexy for somebody like you. Human trafficking is a serious problem and a serious crime. Persons who solicit commercial sex services may be contributing to human trafficking. A message from the Counter Trafficking Unit of the Ministry of National Security. And now, another fire check brought to you by the Trinidad and Tobago Fire Service. Many house fires occur due to faulty or old wiring. Be on the lookout for buzzing or charred switches and outlets that are hard to touch with an odor of burning. Also, observe breakers that trip frequently and flickering or dimming lights, which can be a sign of overloaded circuits or faulty wiring. Fire Check, brought to you by the Trinidad and Tobago Fire Service. Thank you very much for staying with us on our independency at our new time 10 to 12 p.m uh, minister hines we want to move swiftly along now we, we're going to look more closely at the the major units protective services units under the ministry and um, first with with the defense force who have a very important mandate they're not just sitting on in tetron shining their boots as some people might say um, what are some of the developments that you have seen in, in your tender, uh, tenure um, for the Defense Force? Well, let me start with the image that is on the screen. You would have seen there, I suspect, Minister Young, former Minister of National Security, presenting uh, instruments of promotion to the Chief of Defense Staff, as he did Brigadier General Francis. Um, and we now have who is Air Vice Marshal Darrell Daniel, who is the Chief of Defense Staff, and the Vice Chief of Defense Staff is Brigadier General Francis. They were promoted, and I suspect that might be, certainly would be his handing over of those instruments to these worthy office holders. And of course, there were other promotions across the Defense Force um, over the year 2021. And as you all know, promotions mean a whole lot to men and women under arms and in uniform 
it, 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 it is what they dedicate their, their lives to. There are some issues around promotion um, uh, that has come to, to our attention, and we're trying to work them out, for example. In the case of the police, if I might just slip here, sometimes people take issues to court challenging the process or their own position in it, and that interferes with some of the movement. But And then recently, it would have required a person who is commissioner, acting commissioner of police, that is, in order to carry out some promotions, and I'm assured that that is happening. But yes, we've had promotions. The Defense Force has recruited very admirably over the past year. I attended two passing out parades in the last nine months. I think they trained their, their people for about, um, for about uh, three months, I think it is, and they, yes, and they, they managed to do two batches in quick time and the CDS has indicated he wants to bring the force right up to strength and that will impact promotions and the workflow and all of that. So I'm quite happy about that. The Defense Force is focusing, of course, on gender empowerment um, in, in defense and security operations, being gender sensitive to what it does. Uh, the, the, the UTT current campus was handed over to the Trinidad and Tobago Defense Force, and I have on my desk now contemplation by the Defense Force to create a military academy to carry on training, not only for our personnel, but for other personnel around the world, and, and therefore the Defense Force is getting on with the business. Um, as I said a while ago, you had 21 Lance Corporals promoted to the rank of Corporal in, on December the 21st, uh, 2021. And I know two among them, and they were quite proud and quite happy. So that continues. And on the 23rd of December, um, in respect of the Air Guard, six pilots. Right. Thank you, um, folks, for your patience as the internet no, issues. So. Right. The minister is back. Mm -hmm. Right. You just had a little break there, minister. Time just time. a little few um, couple seconds, but you're okay now. You're back with us, right? No. You went offline. Folks, if you're just joining us, you're listening to Annie Penance. You know, some of you just waking up and listening to, well, we, this is our new time, 10 to 12. Remember, Quasi will be on this evening from 6 p.m. So don't um, remember to join him then as we fill in this slot here, 10 to 12. Um, someone, he says, hope promotion in the Trinidad Tobago Regiment catches up with Coast Guard. Um, there's a message from someone on Facebook chat. Minister, you're back with us, right? Yes, I am. Thanks right. Yes. Right. Good. So, so now we, we so that we we wish, of course, the men and women of the Trinidad and Tobago Defence Force all the best. This year we'll be highlighting a lot of because you know it's, as it's our 60th anniversary. There's a lot to look forward to, um, especially from the the, the areas of the Defence Force. So let's move on now to the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service. And we have an image up there with some members of the Trinidad and Tobago Defense Force still. Um, this is Air Guard Promotions. This is Air Guard Promotions. That's what you see here now. Um, so that we just finish off with those images, short man. Um, yeah, that's, that's right. What we've seen there now, Air Guard Promotion recently. And... So we're on to the police now. Right, we come, we're on to the police service now. In the, this is the commissioning of the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service Ballistic Recovery Department. Now, Minister, the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service has a daunting task as well of protecting our nation. And yes. in so doing, the, you know, with the high level of professionalism, can you share some details um, of on the areas of development in the um, police service officers, um, you know, they have to be in the community policing initiatives as well, infrastructure. Can you enlighten us as we share the images on our screen while you do so? Let me start with the Ballistic Recovery Department. I'll start there. And that new state-of-the-art recovery department was commissioned in January of 2021. And it now provides a secure and scientific environment for testing firearms and it has spread up the process of forensic testing. And that has reduced the work of the Forensic Science Center, which previously did all or most of it. And that is so critical because the criminal justice process is, it, it involves the Forensic Science Center and ballistic testing to prove that the thing is a gun, 
that it has the capacity to discharge ammunition. And then when ammunition is discharged, whether it is the projectile that is found in the body or in a wall or someplace, or whether it is the shell casings, these provide very important evidence for the police everywhere in the world, not the least Trinidad and Tobago. And here's where ballistic testing is critical. We have a whole host of illegal firearms in Trinidad and Tobago based on information I would have received from the SSA and from the police service. And of course, the figure is never going to be accurate. I expect that it might even be more than they tell me. And therefore, when the police recover firearms, or when persons are killed, ballistic testing is very critical and the police have been making some headway in this regard. Um, in so far as the Forensic Science Center is concerned, I myself visited the Forensic Science Center shortly after coming to this desk and identified a number of issues. I commissioned a team from the special branch of the police service and the Trinidad and Tobago Defense Force. And I asked them to go into the Forensic Science Center and conduct two audits for me. They did, they produced reports that were um, matters of concern. And as a result of that, we began some specific work with the Forensic Science Center, every aspect of it, trying to provide them with the resources they need and trying to get them to optimum efficiency because it is a critical part of the criminal justice process. It is partly the reason why people don't get their matters heard quickly in the court and you have the backlog in the remand courts that causing another kind of problem. It is the reason why witnesses lose interest, complainants, police officers retire or die and criminals walk free as a result of some of that. And innocent people are not being able to prove themselves to be innocent. So we need to do something about that. And we are doing something about that as we speak. And therefore, um, that will continue. So I am very happy about that too. In so far as the police is concerned, you would have seen recently in the month of July, on the 1st of July, Prime Minister and I went and we formally launched the opening of the Karanaj police station. And recently we've been having complaints, for example, in, 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 in Tobago, in, the, in, in um, Moriah, the people are complaining that they don't have a police station there anymore. In the Barataria area, the member of parliament, Foster Cummins, complains about one in Talparo. And we are now trying to ensure that we restep, we work our way back and get police stations along with other things that might have been envisaged. But these facilities are critical and the population must know they can go there and make a report. And most importantly, as part of the mandate from the Ministry of National Security to the police service, they must respond to every single distress or other call that they get. It, it requires that. The commissioner told me recently, and I am agreed with him, 32% of the murders we had in 2021 would have been, or within recent times, would have been as a result of domestic issues, husband and wife, boyfriend, girlfriend, brother, sister, mother, child. And if the police respond to these issues and resolve them in the best way available in accordance with the law and the NGOs that might be able to help, and this is why the police have put in place what Mr. Jacob and they call a, 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 a community justice clinic where lawyers come and once a month and under the BS, at the BS of the police, free legal advice. And of course, um, community conflict resolution centers, because if you have resolution centers where citizens can go to resolve their disputes, it may not result in a murder and the police Last week, I called the senior superintendent of the Central Division. I received a complaint from a citizen about someone peer, you know, peeping into the house and interfering, trying to get in. They responded powerfully and positively. Later on, the very day I got a report that they found the suspect and they were able to engage him and, and, and bring relief to the victims in that neighborhood. So therefore, response by the police to every matter very critical 
and therefore these police stations are important if you're just joining us you're listening to our independency and we are speaking via video link with the minister of national security texter i get your point about the images that we show and why you're listening on radio and i thank you for that we will try our best to do a description while we show it however as i told you all before this platform gives us an opportunity now remember long ago we had to describe the look of marijuana and a brownie and crack cocaine and crystal meth now we can show you it so that when you see it you know where you would have seen it before and that is on our independency so this is why we are doing this we understand right and um, we will try our best to describe what we're seeing um what we're showing our people who joined us on facebook and youtube um so uh, uh is that all for the prison um for the police no, no, hinkson no, no they, have, they have introduced and on public call and otherwise the use of body cameras they have acquired a number of them that are spread around the police service and they have been granted by the cabinet the authority to acquire another 500 pieces and we expect to do that in this fiscal and of course the ttps gender sensitive as it is has um, on October the 7th and thereafter they trained 200 officers in, in gender responsive issues because there are women in the police service and there are women who the police interface with on the outside. So the police service is in my view coming alive. I saw the Port of Spain City Police Municipal launch an anti-crime plan in the run up to Christmas. I was quite happy about that so to the northeastern division of the police service and several other divisions and therefore i am quite satisfied in my own view members of the public that the police service is beginning to in my definition come alive not that it wasn't alive before not that inspectors were not inspecting and sergeants were not sergeanting <laughs> but they, 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 I, I am seeing that within recent months recent months they are beginning to solve a lot more murders and i suspect it's the passion and the leadership um we have some women as deputy commissioners of police out there today and um, we had recently acting as deputy <coughs> madam joan archie as you're seeing on the screen madam shulera hines madam christopher demonstrating that the police service is gender sensitive and these women are i can assure you ladies and gentlemen they are holding their own quite professionally and quite admirably, and I expect that will continue. Let me tell you, Minister, um, yeah. I am particularly, particularly <laughs> proud of my schoolmate, Joanne Archie. Mm -hmm. Joanne, I mean, Joanne, imagine Joanne, Joanne joined the Trinidad and Tobago Police the same time I joined Trinidad and Tobago Regiment, which is 14 of April 1982. Now Joanne is actually the second most senior person in the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service. And I, I'm, this is so wonderful. I'm so proud of her. And to know that she has made it this far, mm -hmm. I, I show other women listening, even in the, in the Defense Force, will be proud to know that this young lady grew up, born and grew up in village, just like I did. And now she is She's the a career police officer. Career, and, and yeah. Honestly, um, she, she is an exemplar. Really proud of her, really, really proud. Of course, so, Ms. Christopher. So let me say this. Mm -hmm. In the debate recently in the parliament, one opposition member, a fellow called Rodney Charles, jumped in and spoke about it is good to see a, a deputy a commissioner of police. And he was talking about Madam Christopher at that time from South. And I said, what nonsense is this? <laughs> police commissioners and DCPs and top ranking officers like Madam Archie have come from all over this country. Tobago produce commissioners, Mr. Philbert from Dongan Point 14, Mr. Guy from Tobago, Joanna uh, from Deep South. Yeah, I mean, she's cookie. I mean, just, so I just rejected it as rubbish. And these women, as I said, are holding their own. Madam Shulera Hines is heading our very important special branch. DCP Christopher in charge of the operations elements of the police. And Madam Archie, for the time being, is holding the administration. And recently, welfare is very important. A couple of police officers who would have retired having difficulty getting their pension sorted out. I consider that to be a high priority. These men and women would have served and for bureaucratic and administrative reasons, sometimes transfers files all over. And this is general. 
and Joanna Archie has been leading the charge in ensuring that this matter is brought to, to heel. And so the, the story goes. So there's a lot involved there, and I would like to thank them for their professionalism and service. And here you see Madam Gail Charles, who holds the Office of Law Enforcement Policy, which is under the Ministry of National Security as well. She holds the position as director. I require, I requested when I went in there a written firearms policy because there was public and there remains public concern about the issuance of licensed firearms. And I asked for a written policy because it was clear to me that beginning in 1970 when we established the Firearms Act, we never had a written policy. Different commissioners operated it differently, but recently there was good reason for serious public disquiet around this, and we are focusing on this. So let me just tell you that written policy was very professionally and swiftly executed by our Office of Law Enforcement Policy, led by Madam Charles and Mr. Miguel. They produced it. We had a consultation with all the stakeholders, police, defense force, everyone involved in the use of firearms or the licensing process. They gave their comments and the document is now being finally distilled. I'm assured that I will have that final product on Tuesday. I'll be taking it to the cabinet, the National Security Council and cabinet, and I hope that it will be approved. So henceforth, police commissioners or whoever is responsible based on what the cabinet accepts out of those recommendations will be guided by that policy so we won't have the disquiet that we now have to contend with and um, we do so without apology minister as you know best let me say this too as you know Sorry. the cabinet has agreed as well that we have an audit into the firearms registry of the trinidad and tobago police service and in my view it is designed to see exactly where we are because there's a lot of public disquiet i've seen people complain that they have to pay money they were being asked for bribes and all kinds of things and there's public disquiet enough so that we have an audit on the way and they will see where we are and they will make recommendations and the chips will fall where they may if they are chips that's right uh, understood right so we go to the trinidad and tobago police um prison, prison service, service now, now. So, and and before you ask that question guys i wanted just wanted to preface that that question with with this comment from um from facebook from dean um and he's asking whether there's a penal transformation unit in the ministry um and if so what are their functions and milestones and do you think if not do you think there should be one in the ministry um with regard to prisons um with well, their two no sorry go ahead in 2002 the, ca the, the cabinet accepted as its government's policy and it still is the policy that we transform the prison service from the retributive system the punitive system of justice the restorative system of justice. That work I began when I was minister in the Ministry of National Security back in 2002. We made serious advances led by Mr. Roger, Mr. Batiste, and other leaders of the police service since then. That work continues. There is constant work on the, uh, on the, on the, on the transformation to a corrective system and of course, well, the work continues. Insofar as a unit is concerned, yes, there are persons who are with the responsibility for that. Perhaps the caller is suggesting that it be a little more focused in that regard in terms of a transformation team. And um, that is something that can be um, um, given um, active attention. But the work is nonetheless on the way, on the way. Uh, recently, um, the prison commissioner took newly f f refurbished the remand southern wing that the government ensured that was refurbished and toilets put inside of the cells to get rid of the slopping, as they call it. And now that they have finished that wing, they're going on to the northern wing. And the idea is not only to make life easier and better and more humane for the prisoners, but also it's, it's a constitutional issue and we are trying to resolve that. So the work is ongoing. 
And um, I am really looking forward to getting to the bottom of that aspect of it in 2022 or shortly thereafter. So, Minister, uh, that that um, that what I'm hearing here is really, and we've seen some images again. People, we for those of you who are listening, we have some images that we're showing. But is this a, what I'm seeing here now? Is this a, an idea of what the cell would look like? No, this um, is the yeah. physiotherapy. Unit. Physiotherapy. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, right. Oh, right, right. That is the physiotherapy unit because on on the 22nd of January of this year. They, they, they put in place at the prison sports club a physiotherapy unit to deal with officers, both those who are serving and those who are retired. Again, a welfare issue because the prison services are very stressful work environment. Oh, yes, for indeed. Obvious reasons, for yes. obvious reasons. So we have to do more. Actually, I mandated to the leadership of all the organizations, the Defense Force, police, everybody. I insist that we pay particular attention to the welfare of all of our personnel. I saw recently a police sergeant, a female, took her own life. I saw a young sailor in the Kokorit area take his own life. Yes. I heard that a captain, a captain in the army or a major, I think it was, took his own life a couple of years ago. These mm -hmm. things trouble me. And there might be, and then as you know, Garth, there are those who get unfortunately engaged with drug use and whose lives begin to fall apart. Yes. And, and you and I working on a particular case right now as we speak, I ask you yes. about yourself. Yes. And you know what I'm talking about. Yes, sir. So the welfare of our men and women, their promotion, their general welfare and well being, we will we treat with we treat with absolute importance. And it is critical if you have to get people to commit to the kind of work that we want us to perform. Welfare is important, and that room is part of that observation. Right. We also engage prisoners, in, engage them this year, and in October, on October the 13th, inmates from Trinidad and Tobago's prison participated in an intercontinental uh, chess championship competition for prisoners, and they participated in that, and I understand they did very well. And our female prisoners emerged in third position internationally, and our males got into fifth position. I'm sure they're looking forward to another opportunity when both teams will rise to number one and make us proud. In so far as uh, COVID fight and the prison is concerned, fortunately, the prison commissioner advises me that we've only lost six prison officers and two prisoners i think they have been doing a fantastic job inside of that prison i am not impressed at the vaccine uptake rate but that's another matter and we are all working trying to encourage more prison officers police officers citizens generally to get vaccinated and assist in dealing with covid 19 and its ugly performances Yes, yes. Minister Diatin and I actually went into prison radio, Mac Rise Maximum Radio, which mm -hmm. you and Natasha are personally familiar with. Yes, sir. We speak of it before, and we were able to engage all of the prisons in a conversation with health professionals about the vaccine. And we understand that following that, there was an improvement in the vaccine uptake in the prison, though not to the level that we would have liked. We appointed Mr. Dennis Pulchan, a substantive commission of police in July, and that is important for him as an individual professionally and for morale in the entire prison service. Yes. We appointed um, some deputy commissioners of prison, two of them, and I handed over their instruments, uh, uh, their letters, because they would have been appointed, of course, by the police service commission, and we are engaged in getting the business of the prison service going on. July the 26th, 176 prison officers, prison officers won, including 16 females were promoted to the rank of prison officer two. And as we already established, promotion is very important to these men and women for all kinds of reasons, not the least financial benefits when they would have retired, their pay packages and retirement would be a lot better the higher up the ranks they go and therefore we have to keep the promotions going in accordance with the regulations and the operations and of course 15 officers in september 
On the 22nd, actually, 15 officers were promoted to the first division of the prison service. Um, five assistant superintendents went to the rank of soup, and 10 prison supervisors went to the rank of assistant superintendents of prison. And so that is happening. And finally, on this matter, the prison service copped an award for service excellence, the President's Award for Innovation and Service Excellence for the public sector in 2021. So with all of the complaints, with all of the issues, with all of the challenges, the men and women of the prison service, and they faced a tough year. Some of their colleagues were murdered by criminals in this country, and we have had to deal with it. This was one of the first things that confronted me for the last nine months. And I work very closely with the prison leadership. I work with the prison association. I work with other elements of the national security family in dealing with this issue, and we are dealing with it. The prison service can be assured that they are not in this alone. We are with them and we are committed. And I can tell you, the prime minister, as head of the National Security Council, insists to me almost every time we speak that the police continue to investigate those matters, get to the bottom of them, and do all that we must to protect our prison officers. And they must do all that they must to protect themselves in this struggle for law and order in this country for our soul. Minister, because some people want to kill themselves into jail and then kill themselves out too. Obviously, but um, if you're just joining us, folks, you're listening to Independence at a new time from 10 to 12. And we are having a video chat with the Minister of National Security here this morning, the Honorable Fitzgerald Hines. And he's just and running through, Minister. We just have about 30 minutes again, and you know, time flies. So let's quickly go straight to the fire service and um, and and tell us. The, I mean, they too have been working, they, they made their contribution in 2021. Um, Let's the, 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 with the focus and the, the public is a COVID the mandate. They have also focused on promoting greater education and public awareness. We've had them on here many times too as well. Um, any any word on the fire service and, and plans for them going forward? Yes, yes, the fire service again, you know, like an insurance policy, like an umbrella. You, you, you must have it. And uh, you need it in times of emergency. And the fire service is a very, I think, one of the more professional elements of the entire government mm. platform. Engineering is a very important thing, dealing with combusted materials, how to deal with different types and causes of fires. They have so many things that, that take them into the realm of engineering and the science. That's so hey, guys. Good day, good day. My name is 4845, Firefighter Thomas. And... Administer, that was a mistake. Um, on I find part. them to be a... That's all right. I find them to be a supremely professional bunch and led by Mr. Bristow. And prior to that, when I went there by Mr. Marlon Smith, who was acting as chief fire officer at the time, I could not ask for more. I know they have challenges. I've listened to complaints about breathing equipment. Recently, I had to reply to that. We are always providing them with the resources that they need and at the rate that the country can afford. I'm satisfied that the administration of the fire service is on top of the business. We are making efforts to find a location or two for different fire stations in areas that they consider them to be useful. And very recently, there was a fire on the Point Lisa's industrial estate in a warehouse. That is a very gas powered and gas use utilizing plant. And the building they went to was beset with some serious steel reinforcement. So they had particular challenges and they had to pull officers from all over the central and the Southern division. They utilized 17 different types well, 17 different appliances, water pumps, water tanks, hazmat, hazchem, different elements of the firefighting technique. They utilize several personnel from all over about, I understand about 90,000 liters of water was used 
but they were able to bring that fire under control and to stop the devastation that was possible. I raise that because there are concerns raised by even elements of the fire service that they don't have nothing, things so bad, you will swear they only have crocus bag to beat fire wherever they go. That is not the truth. These are highly trained bunch of professionals who have equipment and resources, always could do with more, always could modernize, always need more resources, but not without the capacity. And I use that example on the point, Lisa's industrial estate, as an example of how they were able to mobilize all of their forces and deal professionally and definitively with a major threat. And I am quite happy with that and the work of the fire services to continue. Any, um, Minister, before we move on, any, any um, um, thoughts about the auxiliary arm of the fire service? Have you all been in talks at all? Well, I have not had any direct conversation with right. the auxiliary officers, other than, well, individuals among them would have come, no representative group. But when right. I met with the fire service association, they raised the question of the auxiliaries. Again, not a new issue because there have been what we call absorption over many years. Persons come in as auxiliaries, and I'll tell you, even like those who come in as SRPs in the police service, and they, 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 they come in understanding that this is temporary work, this is a few hours a week. Those are the engagements, but sometimes by virtue of their longevity in those positions, and sometimes, and this is real because of the demands of the administration of whether it's the fire service or the police service, they work these people a lot more than was initially planned and envisaged. So different kinds of factors get involved and different expectations get involved. And that's what you have on an ongoing basis. So we are working it through as we have worked it through before, and we understand both sides of the argument. We understand that you come on certain terms of conditions and ought not to expect more, but we also understand that if you are asked to do more and there are long-term arrangements and there's some basic qualification that could get you into the substantive service, these are things that need to be looked at as they have been looked on before. So I have a very open mind and I would typically take my advice from the leaders of those organizations, pass it through the cabinet for its overview and so on and then we can harden it into action now minister before we go to recruitment um could i suggest um humbly suggest that there are a number of questions that have been posted on facebook right um is it possible that your communications unit and probably in, in collaboration with your good self can come together and answer some of these questions because obviously we would not be able to answer all today but we normally ask our guests after the program if someone can provide oh, answers yeah. to some of these questions posted here is that I possible ensure, i will ensure that those questions are to the extent that they can be because not all questions are sincere not all questions are um, uh, worthy of attention, but every one of them that are, and every one that is worthy of attention will be answered, and I'll make the answers available to you in the shortest possible time. I appreciate that very much. So, we're looking at recruiting now for all arms, the prison, police, the defense force, um, and then from that we, we, we go to the counter-trafficking unit. Um, because they are very, very important unit. We cannot forget the human service that they are I mean, people don't know the amount of work that they do. But as far as recruiting go, everybody up to standard, or are we looking to improve, improve on that this year? Yeah, we're looking to improve on it. As I say, it appears that the Defense Force is ahead of the game, but everyone needs more personnel. And, you know, for the young people of Trinidad and Tobago, there's this myth that nothing is being done for young people in all of these services in national security. We typically come in there up to age 23 or age 25. In the case of the police service, it's more like age 35. But it's only young people that they hire. And yes, there have been recruitment from the defense force, recruitment into the prison service, recruitment into the police service, where I did mention prison before, and I mentioned the defense force. So here I'll tell you, in, in October of this year, 91 recruits, including 65 males, and 26 females were inducted into the police service. And of course, on December the 18th, 15 recruits 
of the second batch one of 2021 graduated from the police academy. So they are all engaged in recruitment as is necessary. As I said, it spreads out the workload and it makes mobile mobility to the top a little more fluent and a little more easy. And therefore, for all those reasons, it's a good thing. And of course, most of all, our service to the public would be a lot more effective and we wouldn't be good to say we don't have the resources to do it. So we are pushing it hard. Right. So as recruitment is concerned. Yes. Lovely. Um, Hinkson, let's go to A3. And that's the counter trafficking unit. Um, this unit, uh, as you know, I mean, you know, much have been said about them and we know the work they have been doing. And of course, they partnered with us and they're an arm of the Ministry of National Security. And update us on the work they've done and the, the plans they have for them in the future. I, um, the image you're seeing now is they had, that's part of a competition we had with them and the Civilian Conservation Corps, which was re really, it went off really, really well. That was for the um, Human Trafficking Awareness Week and, and the CCC participated. It was lovely. But your thoughts on the CTU? Well, we engaged in a number of consultations through 2020, and it is all heading towards establishing a, a new plan of action for the trafficking in persons, what we call TIPS. Uh, the National Plan of Action Against Trafficking in Persons consists of a comprehensive set of measures to guide all stakeholders. And in this business, all stakeholders are really necessary because human trafficking can be manifest in the workplace, in a gas station, in, in, in a prostitution ring, in, 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 in a domestic setting, somebody as a servant or a housekeeper in some place. So it's really, it really genuinely requires a whole of government, whole of agency, whole of country approach. And we engage many faith-based organizations, general NGOs, university lecturers, government ministries, national security divisions, the judiciary, public health inspectors, all of these were some of the agencies who were consulted in order to establish this new national plan of action. We are assessed by our international partners, particularly the State Department of the US in compliance with some of their laws on the business of counter trafficking. And we are graded on the basis of our perceived or our performance we were recently downgraded, I would say, to tier two watch lists when we were just a tier two. And that is a very ominous state of affairs. So when I went to the ministry nine months ago and I sensed this in my collaboration with Madam Wheeler, who heads the counter trafficking unit, and Mr. Paponet and the chief immigration officer and the other people of the task force that I work with, um, uh, including our PSs and so on, I decided that we will pay particular. So I have gotten very directly involved in this work and that work is ongoing. Recently, we were able to submit to the, our assessors up-to-date reports on where we are in so far as our annual report requirement is concerned. And we identify all of the good things, the training we have done, our outreach to other NGOs, the fact that we prosecuted 12 people very recently because one of the things they want to see, well, generally they want to see the country doing all that is necessary and reasonable to fight human trafficking. It exists in the United States. It exists in England. It exists in Canada. It exists all over the world. And all they, they are asking is that each country, including Trinidad and Tobago, of course, show that we are doing all that is possible. So prosecutions play a very important part in that. It shows that we are intent on locking up people who are found guilty of the law that we pass to prevent against human trafficking. And yes, we locked up 12 of them recently, and that included three police officers. Hmm. And I've had reports about other elements of uniform personnel. In fact, in the criticism we got from our international partners, they allege that we have uniform personnel in our ranks. Who yes. are engaged in this. So the fact that we were able to find evidence and to prosecute three of them is, is music to my ear. It's unfortunate, it's embarrassing, but it is necessary. And so yes. the story goes. We are collaborating with the judiciary to get these matters 
as far as it's possible without infringing on the judiciary's independence, without infringing on any other person's constitutional rights, we are pushing to see if in the criminal justice process we could get these matters attended to as quickly as possible so that we can demonstrate internationally that we are taking counter-trafficking measures to protect the people of Trinidad and Tobago. With the influx of Venezuelans, it is very challenging. And with many willing participants, women leaving their countries all over South America, as far as Colombia, all over, to come here to get involved in prostitution and other things, even though I am, I've learned that they appear to be doing it willingly, and in some cases doing it willingly, it may still not abdicate the need for our counter-trafficking unit to go closely inside of it, and of they still do find elements of human trafficking. And it is to stamp out this and to deal with it. Well, you have an able and willing and hard-working leader in Ms. Alana Wheeler. Yes. And um, we hope, you know, this year they get a little more strength so that they can deal with the challenges ahead for 2022. Um, and we are doing our part on our independency, of course, to support. And we are we actually working, as you know, on uh, a television series to that end to, to, raise, to continue to raise awareness about this scourge, this crime of human trafficking. No, independence certainly has, and let me record my appreciation and thanks to you all for that work you've been doing for many years. And I really appreciate the fact that you have taken this issue up and that you are doing some work. And finally, I would say, in collaboration with our partners, particularly the United Kingdom, and more specifically the United States in this particular regard, we are about to get an expert we have requested an expert from one of those countries who will come and spend some time as a bit of a coach working with us so that he or she will direct us to all of the minute that is involved in this business so we will be running fast and we'll be running smoothly and cleanly in our response to this and therefore hopefully catch their eyes so that we will move back from where we are to supreme status of full compliance by our assessor. Right. So, Minister, um, yes. we, we want to open the we lines. take some calls and then we, so we have in between some questions on the fly. I know you, you're required not to answer on your feet here. So, get that, um, that Nike sneakers on here now. <laughs> He's and, well um, equipped to do that. <laughs> I, mean, sure. I know you could do that. Right. Now, from one, one, um, a retired major asking, seeing that an inspector of prisons will, um, was recently appointed, when is the team? A, is there an intention going forward to um, to appoint um, con uh, the same for the defense force and administration inspection and ordinance um, in accordance with the regulation section 244 of the defense act and this is from someone listening and they asking the question um, would you have a comparison for the defense force I'll say very quickly um the, 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 the administration, I have, it has never come to me that that is an issue or deficiency. Right. Uh, now that you have raised I will inquire about that. But since I'm on this desk, it has never come alive as an issue um, that I can recall. I may be wrong because I got a full presentation of the state of affairs of the Defense Force led by Brigadier General Francis on shortly after I came into this desk. And I made copious notes. It may be among them, but it has not emerged as an issue. But now that it is raised, I will inquire about this and certainly want to bring equity and justice to all arms of national security. Yes, so we will thank, let's you for, let's thank you for that. Let's open the line 6223937. Before we go to our first call, there, there was a question about um, the volume of work that you have to do as, as Minister of National Security. Do you think in the near future we may see... Uh, Minister of State in your ministry to sh sort of share up the work because it is a very onerous task. And while, while you, I want to answer that, um, you have plans to, to use there are a lot of military veterans out there who retired and they want to offer their service. Do you have any plans to meet with them and you know involve them in the in the in the fight against and addressing crime and youth I development? Have, I have done that in the past and I will continue to do that. I am very, very open 
to learning from the experience of those who have gone before. It is a very valuable tool for me as I speak to you. I do that and will continue. The reserves of the Defense Force are actually, a lot of them are persons who would have left the, uh, the Defense Force and have now continued to serve as reserves. And therefore, I collaborate very regularly with them. And I, I try to keep an open door as minister. Once a serving or former member approaches me, I take their concerns pretty seriously because experience is the greatest teacher, and I will continue to do that. But the question of um, someone else coming to the Ministry of National Security, I would welcome that, but that is exclusively a matter for the Prime Minister. What I have to make sure is that I, I get on with the work as I have been doing and I don't want to give him the impression that I'm complaining about anything because, quite frankly, I'm not. Right. If he produces someone, I'll not be. I'll, I'll be quite happy to do that. Not averse to that. More <laughs> merrier. Let's take a call. Six two two three nine three seven. Hello. Good morning. Oh, so good morning. Good morning. Good morning. And good morning to the minister as well. Not to the minister. To the minister. Yes, the minister of national security. Yes, ma'am. Go ahead. Yes. What I would like to find out, uh, Mr. Minister. Um, concerning Tobago with the Tobago prison, you know, mm. many years, you know, we keep hearing that they wanted to build a new prison because of some reason, someday, one day, you don't know if this one might fall. Into the sea. So what say you on that? And with the, the incident that took place recently by the substation, um, just probably put in the fire. Um, you know, they have a still picture of the person, somebody or some, you know, or some, someone might identify the person, you know, who did the act then. Instead of just putting the, the firearm and claiming, like, asking that they will get a ransom then. I believe they could put a still picture of the individual. That's Thank a good you. question. Thank you very much. Thank you. Minister, quickly, the depot in, in, in Tobago, any chance to transform into a prison? I am aware that we need a new prison facility, and I know there has been a lot of toing and froing around this. I have taken it as a matter of commitment to get it done. There have been issues about where it will be, when it is identified for one place. There are objectors, you know. Everybody in Trinidad wants to go to heaven. Nobody wants that. Correct. Everybody wants everything dealt with, but they don't want it in their neighborhood. In their neighborhood, they yes. Yep. It. For real. Yeah. It's just, but government is not about popularity. Government is about making hard decisions. And it is a matter that I'm looking into and I intend to resolve it very, very, very quickly. Quite frankly. 622-397. Let's hear another call quickly. Hello. Hello, morning. Hello, good morning. I like to ask you so what are you trying to say to the road task force? Did you call all the other uh, um, agencies under the Ministry of National Security? And nothing was mentioned by the candidate at it for. Cadet Force. Yep. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you for that. And and the last question from the caller too about the, the firearm, the Galil that went missing from the station. Um Minister, I'll just respond to that. But the, this person mentioned the Cadet Force. Um they're still under the purview of the Ministry of National Security, aren't they? Very quickly, um yes, the cadet of course, of course. And in fact, recently we uh, reinstated it in the Cadet Force. In the, in, in the defense section of the ministry, um, uh, this is a very, very, very sustainable, long-standing, credible youth program managed by the Ministry of National Security. There are many elements of national security that went over to the Ministry of Youth Development and National Service, but we kept the cadet force here because they do touch ammunition in some ways in their training and different things. For that reason, we generally kept it here. It's a very important youth program. Recently, I had the Cadet Force Advisory Board reinstated, and um, we have to appoint a commandant. We have I had acting commandant within recent times, and we have to deal with that. I'm pressing hard on that because I, like the caller, understand the importance of it. I was a cadet myself. I know what has contributed to our lives, what it has contributed to this society and therefore it is a high priority for us and yes we do so in so far as the firearm at sound is concerned i've already publicly stated that i'm embarrassed i'm ashamed and i was reminded in that that we have collaborators in the services who would make these things happen the matter is under investigation in so far as putting faces on the papers and otherwise 
There are legal implications for that until you get a certain stage. So while I understand the woman's anxiety, it has to get to a certain stage before you could put the picture person's picture because there are issues of law around that and therefore we watch but that very carefully. We, I, I we think don't want to create problems. I, I, one. I think what you were referring to though, the image that uh, they, they, um, that exists with the guy running away from the station unfortunately we do have one with him going in and you know these it's but so much could be said about this okay. issue but yeah a lot could be said about that a yeah. lot could be said about that but suffice it to say that um, that too is a matter that is gaining the attention of, 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 of those who are investigating it. They would have noted it. And that is gaining their attention too because, you know, the thing is. And therefore, at this stage, I don't know if it's possible or if it is proper to publish anybody's face. I leave that to the experts in the police service. Right. Next call, 622-3937. Hello. Good morning. Hello. Good morning. Morning. The morning. minister is listening. Go ahead with your question. Yeah. Are you, are you here? Yes, yes, go ahead, are. sir. Pleasant good morning to Mr. Hines. And to you, dear brother. Good morning. Okay, I'm calling you from Charlottesville, Tobago. All right. Okay, I am an ex in 2003, which you was a part of. We talked to you and we were absor um, absorbed into the, in the, in the past service. However, we have made some years before that, and since that time, time of retirement, we have not that wasn't added on onto our our gratuity. So there are some of my batches and them who left the work without no pension and no gratuity. So mm -hmm. you all need to look into that because some of them have, have passed on, they have died, their family have nothing, and mm -hmm. we are still here waiting to get our money because the money is taken away from us. Some um. House allowance, meal allowance, and we are in the court for over 20 years now, and we can't get no address. We need, or we need to do something about it. Please. Thank you very much, Thank sir. Thank you very much, sir. Mr. 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 Mesa, you heard that passion there. Has this come yeah, to your attention I'm, at all? You know, you know, I'm sufficiently experienced to know. I've just heard a synopsis of his perception of the situation, but trust and believe me. There are other perspectives. It is not a matter that I'm familiar with, immediately familiar with. And again, I'll ask my communications people to find out about it and report to me. Um, and I'll collaborate with the chief fire officer on the matter. Uh, it now being brought to me. But um, I'm sure that there are other perspectives and versions of what we have just heard. But I will certainly look into it. And I do commiserate with the brother down there in Charlottesville. Right. 622 Good morning. Hello. Hello. Good morning um, to Minister Hines. He's listening. To Natasha and God. Hey, you are alive? Hello. Yeah, nice to hear you. Yeah, I'm thanking God for seeing another year, God. Oh, right. boy, so much better around me here in the Vale, anyway. Go ahead, tell it. Yes. Um, I want to say, Nari Kelimo, to Dr. Rowley and Minister Hines, I give you all praise for what you all have done in improving the Trinidad and Tobago Coast Guard. I am now seeing some good results from the Coast Guard. They are patrolling our borders and intercepting these Venezuelan boats. So I say thank you, thank you, thank you to both of you all and to the Coast Guard officers. Thank Have you. Have a wonderful day. Thank you very much, thank you. Madam Digo Martin. It's, um, six two two three nine. Minister, thank you very quickly, much. Your, your track shoes again, your track shoes again, Board of Inspectors. Do we will we see one soon for the prison for the prison instead of one prison as, inspector? As, as, as it now stands, the prison act, act makes provision. The prisons act makes provision for an inspector of prisons. Of course, in the modernization and the improvement of the way we do business, we have open airs, Mister. Cedric Neptune, who was recently appointed as inspector of prisons did raise with me before his appointment his observation of what happens in Australia and other parts of the Commonwealth, of which we are a part as a former British colony. And in those places, they have an inspector rate, meaning not an individual, but a right. team That's right. institution. And therefore, it is something I have an open ear to. 
But I can't commit to that until I get the support of the cabinet of Trinidad and Tobago. I am not the cabinet. And right. therefore, I have an open mind. It sounds very appealing, but we have to look at this, look at it in the context of Trinidad and Tobago. So when those proposals had none come to me, I have a very open mind and quite willing to contemplate anything to do with improving the way we do the business and improving the circumstances of prisoners and making sure the law and the constitution of Trinidad and Tobago are adequately observed and, and, and served. We take in the cutting the close, but we take one more quickly, quickly, quickly. Hello, morning. Good morning, Mr. Hines and, and Gad and Natasha and Trent Bigo. Mr. Hines, I want to find out that if the, a, a police officer being thrown out of the police service, I want to if it is right to put his face in the papers because remember he was a police officer and being you know pushed around, pushing around and doing whatever. If he can still move around and, and act as a police still because people would not know he's not in the service that he can do. It's right to put his face in the papers. I think it should be. All right, Manu. Thanks very much. Besides, there's a final question for you. We have major news coming up in, in a minute time. An interesting thought, but that too will have legal implications and um, it's not a matter that I, I have in contemplation to up to this point. Right. Well, Minister, we'd like to thank you so much for your time this morning. It has been a really comprehensive discussion. As someone says, it's, that's a very comprehensive report from the Ministry. We thank you very much. And um, again, we request that your comms team um, visit our Facebook page and if they can, in collaboration with your good self, answer some of the questions that were posed that we couldn't get to. All right, sir? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And let me close by simply thanking you as well, thanking the people of Trinidad and Tobago, thanking the Prime Minister for the opportunity, the privilege to do this business, and of course, to commiserate with the prison officers and their families and all the officers of national security. Police everyone who have lost members, we have lost members, and you have lost family members uh, due to COVID-19 and to urge your family, urge your friends, and urge each other to vaccinate in order to prevent future occurrences. Thank you all very much. Good luck, and God bless you. Thank you very much, Thank Minister. You, um, Hinson, let's go out with um, G3. And folks, we'll see you all next Sunday, God's willing. So, Hinson, and up next, Major News at 12 with Mr. Sterling Henderson. Good afternoon. Dependency will be a morning show in 2022. That's right. I on Dependency marks 20 years on the air. We're taking our groundbreaking brand of radio to a whole new audience. Whole new audience. From the team that took you inside prisons in the UK. I was being held in charge for conspiracy to import cocaine into the UK. We spoke with men and women who have paid for their crimes. They didn't tell me if I bring him back and I get catch. I will get 14 years in prison. Then. They didn't say that. We brought you the glamour of feature film. I do have a package to drop off in three days. For you, Alejandro, anything. I will pay you each 5,000 euros. And the squalor of death row. It's a common person from a case in the high court in Port Aspen, and it was in common many guitar. And of course, the testimonies of men and women with drug use disorders. I was quite devastated and got involved with the wrong company. The man who I used to deal with, he gave me a job to drive him around. That's a go and buy cocaine and smoke cocaine. From Toronto to London, New York to Los Angeles, Scarborough to Point Fortin, and everywhere in between, I on Dependency has been your source for drug information. Join us as we move to Sunday mornings, 10 a.m. Don't miss I on Dependency. Listen live on I95.5 FM or watch the live stream on Facebook and YouTube. I on Dependency. We don't just share stories. We change lives. We change lives.